So uh, it's going to be very hard to, to fill Dr. Wagner's shoes, but, but I'll try to, because my feet are, you know, smaller. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to do that. So my name is McVib Gamera. I'm from Eastern Virginia Medical School. I serve as the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion. And, uh, and we, so we talked about um, having some conversation around, you know, issues of cultural competency and implicit bias and so on. So, um, so what I will do is, you know, just give a, a, a kind of a journey in, in, in medicine and medical education and patient care that has informed these thoughts about, you know, what is culture and what is cultural competency. And there's a change, it's called now cultural humility because competency is kind of a a very broad word that doesn't capture things, and then bias in healthcare, and that, and then how that affects, you know, what we do and how we should do things, and how it affects health and health outcomes and so on. All right, so we're going to be looking at just generally what is, you know, cultural awareness and cultural humility, and then discuss, you know, what is uh, bias and bias, particularly something called implicit bias. So the bias that we don't know of, but we, you know, have right? We all do have it, but we don't know about it. So therefore, we act in ways uh, uh, that, that actually is affected by that bias without really knowing. And then that could have some impact on whatever it, it is that we do, right? So, um, so first, let me ask you, you know, I'll start with this case, you know, like a father and his son are out driving. They're involved in an accident. The father is killed and the son is in critical condition. The son is rushed to the hospital and prepared for, for the operation. The doctor comes in, sees the patient, ex and exclaims, I can't operate, it's my son. How can that be? If you know the case, don't say anything. Because it's the mother? What is that? The mother came in and saw the Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I was going to say there are two fathers. Okay. Yeah. Most of the answer is that, you know, like nobody really comes to think that it's the mother because they, you know, everybody kind of, when you m imagine like, you know, this scenario, the case, it's always a male figure that comes up in your brain, right? You know, so then, you know, we kind of tend to say, most of us would say, oh, how can that be? It must be a stepfather. It's another father. It's like, you know, we are always, you know, stuck with that male image, right? And so it's hard to think oh, there's a surgeon and it's a woman, right? So those are, you know, some of the things that we are stuck with. So this is informed by culture in general, right? You know, like because we are, um, we are all, you know, engaged with culture and culture is everything, you know, everything we know and we do and we live and we breathe is informed by the culture that surrounds us. And it's primarily culture is, you know, the way we, uh, communicate, right? You know, like the way we actually form, you know, things, the way we uh, process information, and the way we interact with that information with each other. And so culture is, you know, primarily communication, right? You know, how we communicate, not only verbally and so on, but how we communicate with everything, right? You know, like how, you know, why do we have, you know, like the place like this? Like we, we have set up this place in this way uh, because we thought, oh, you know, like there would be a circular thing and someone would stand up here and talk and so therefore everybody has to look this way. That's all, you know, informed by somehow we decided at one point that's the way to do it, right? Maybe that's not the right way, but it's the way to do it and that becomes a culture and then we, you know, we do that. We could have sat in a circle, right? We could have all sat down. That would have been another, you know, thought of how to communicate. That would have had a different way of thinking, right? If we did that, for example. So it's like the way, so culture informs everything. How we build things, why we build this, this, this place in this way, why we build the, the chairs in this manner, how we communicate, the materials we build, all our behavior is informed by that. And so, and then the other description of culture that everybody talks about is that, oh, culture is, you know, can be race and ethnicity and you know, the environment and socioeconomic status, who is poor, who is rich, has, you know, already, you know, like that kind of a culture. The level, you know, of assimilation, how we kind of get together and we kind of, oh, either we include or exclude others based on whatever, 
all of those things mean. Sexual orientation, gender identity, all of those are kind of parts of the cultural environment that we live in. And they inform how we behave and what we do and how we do things, right? And medicine, healthcare has also a culture of its own. You know, like what you are wearing is a culture. You know, like, you know, the, the blue thing that you're wearing, that is, you know, that informs who you are, what you do. It informs somebody, you know, like, oh, I'm this and you are somebody else, you know, and, and this is what I do. And that's, those are all, um, all developed over time. And so that has a meaning of, you know, which has a belief system, a value system, you know, like all of that is kind of integrated in, that, in the way that, that it's built. And then, you know, like the whole cultural things that have also gone through life with healthcare informs how patients think and behave and, you know, um, think about their care or how comfortable they are or, or not comfortable they are in the, in the environment is informed by those historical things. This is Tuskegee, for example, right? You know, Tuskegee, does everybody know about the Tuskegee experiment? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So the, the Tuskegee experiment was a big deal, right? You know, like for many people. And so that kind of informs, you know, how um, regardless of what, you know, how people feel internally in terms of, you know, like their, their perception and comfort level towards healthcare, right? You know, so that kind of informs it. And it's, and that's, and that's, you know, we have had all kinds of, you know, cultural history with, uh, uh, with healthcare, right? You know, so, so that is, you know, Ellis Island, for example, right? You know, where you see the, the lady, you know, like looking at the hair like that, you know, and then that's Ellis Island and there are, you know, people immigrating uh, from mostly from Europe at that time. And, and they're looking for lice, right? You know, like for, uh, for a, a lot of people. And you know, what was the, the major case that actually um, decided for people not to get in, in that time, in that period? It was trachoma. So a lot of people actually, you know, the eye disease, you know, trachoma. That was what actually was the filter in most cases, which didn't allow people to get in. Right, you know, so, the, but that, you know, informs what the time, you know, that time, then that means something, you know, whether you have lice or whether you have trachoma, you know, like, means something into your cultural identity, right? You know, like of how you come in, who accepts you, who doesn't accept you, and, and what it means in your life, right? So, these are all, you know, informed by, by different things, you know, and so, and then, you know, we communicate in different ways, this is, you know, like, an advertising, for example, from the 50s, maybe, you know, like how to, you know, you have to, the, the culture of hygiene, you know, that we do. And then, you know, this is when we were advertising cigarettes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, these are actually physicians who are smoking and advertising cigarettes as a good thing to do, right? And that was just a few years ago, right? That wasn't that long ago. And, but it changed. Now, you know, if you see a doctor or a nurse smoking in the facility, it would be a problem, right? But that wasn't the case. They were like we had, you know, all the, the, in the media, on TV, you would see everybody smoking in the, uh, the discussing the, the doctor's office and everybody was smoking and all of a sudden, oh, it's not a good thing, right? You know, that's, you know, we all accept it. We changed the culture. Smoking was a really a great thing then. You know, it was a status of, you know, like, oh, you're cool, you're strong, you're, independent, you are, if you're a woman and smoking, you are, you know, kind of um, intellectual and independent. Those were the things that informed the time. You were the marble man, be like that. Those, those were the kind of the cultural settings we, we knew. And then now we think, you know, no, that's not a good thing. You know, like it's better to run and jog and have great, you know, like juice in the morning and do yoga, right? You know, like those are, you know, the, the new things that inform our culture and everybody feels that way. So medicine, so there is a, there is also culture evolves and develops, right? And that has been the case in medicine, you know, like from, you know, the, the Cartesian thought of, you know, like, oh, the mind and the body are very separated. There's nothing here, you know, no connection to the era of the microbiology where we thought, you know, like, oh, you know, if you have an illness, it must be an, inv an invasion by an outside, you know, kind of organism, so now everything was concentrated on attacking an organism that invaded you, right? You know, that was the whole focus. To the 
body as a, uh, as a place where we need to get in and fix things. So those were the surgical you know, processes where you know, isolate and identify and fix. You know, those were the things that we looked at, at you know, part of history on medicine. And then it, but all of these things, when we were thinking of the microbiological, all of those things that we were looking at, they, they did not, they looked at the biomedical aspect of medicine only, right? You know, they looked at the body as something that you kind of, oh, you approach, you look at it, you, you either, you know, you kill the what attacked it, uh, or you dismantle and fix it and so on. Um, but the psychosocial factor was not there. Right, you know, like the person, you know, was not really there in a way, right? And so, in, in so historically, um, the first step in this in this process of you know ev evolution was the whole idea of patient centeredness. You know, so the the idea that oh, you know, like there is something we have to communicate with somebody there, right? And um, and patient centeredness had in, an interpersonal context where you know, like oh, you need you know the um, the, the healthcare professional and the patient have to have some communication. And then it has also a systems approach, right? You know, the system has to, you know, a person actually has to navigate through the system, right? So the system has to be um, comfortable for the person to navigate it. This approach is overlap and it's a cultural shift, right? You know, from the biomedical, which the, takes away the person and looks at the body, to the psychosocial, <coughs> which looks at the, you know, the person and what they're thinking and where they're coming from and who they are and who their family is and all of those things, right? And so the patient-centeredness has the, interp it's a, the interpersonal, it's an interpersonal model. So it's the first time where the, the care, healthcare professional starts to think, oh, I have to enter actually for the first time into the, into the patient's mind to see you know, like who they are, what they are, and how they are doing, you know, through their eyes as well, you know? And so, you know, it, it adapts a biopsychosocial model. And then it has also another thing. It's a sharing of power as well. So the power is not any more than in the, in the healthcare professional, because when it was the, the model of the biomedical model, you have just a body in front of you and it's all yours, right? You know. But now it's, you know, you're sharing that responsibility with the patient. You're saying, okay, how do you feel? And you want to know how they feel. And you want to understand where they come from. And you want to understand how they can be taken care of, right? How they have actually um, some power over their healing, you know? So it's not only your responsibility, but a shared responsibility. And then the other side of it is also that for the first time, the healthcare professional becomes a person as well, because it was a robot before, right? It, it was, oh, you are just an expert, a, a robot who comes in, fix things, or kills an organism, or things like But now, you're somebody who has a feeling. You're also someone, right? You know, like you are in that communication and interaction, you're coming, you know, from somewhere, right? You know, your, your kid was sick, and, um, you just lost a father and you know, like whatever it is, right? You know, like, and then you are now in that communication with the patient and then all of that comes together and you are, you are vulnerable as well, right? You're not kind of a robot and do it all kind of person, but, but that, that sharing actually creates a, 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 an environment where caring can happen because it's healthcare, right? You know, so that is, you know, you can't care. Um, if, if you, you are not there, right? So you have to be there in order to care and you have to come with yourself as you are. And so that is, you know, what brings this interpersonal model. But it's also a system-wide model. So that is, you know, that now it becomes to understand that it integrates the patient value, patient's values in the, in the care system, right? So the patient comes in and you have to understand them they have to see, you know, like whether the, you know, the, the paint of the place, you know, is, you know, kind of, is it, is it good or bad? Does it make me more sick, you know, to come in here and, and see, a, you know, a different paint while I'm, you know, while I'm in the waiting room? Um, how is care coordinated? How is, you know, how does transition happen, right? You know, all of those things become a systems model where we think, how does the patient navigate through the system? And then comfort. 
So for the first time, we start thinking, you know, like, oh, is the patient in pain, <coughs> right? You know, like, how, you know, how is the, their comfort taken care of? And how are they supported? So now we're not thinking about the only the patient. We start thinking about, you know, oh, who is with them? You know, do they have somebody they live with? You know, who, is, uh, who are we negotiating with beyond the patient, right? Who is going to give them their medication? Um, how, who is going to bring them? To, for checkup. I mean, all of those things then become um, important. And then, you know, the communication b becomes Im important as well. You know, you have you know, a brochure or you have, you know, the plasma screen, you know, kind of going, giving information, and then you start thinking, well, does anybody understand it at all, right? You know, like, what do they, or does, do they, what do they feel about it? You start, you know, like thinking about them, you start asking for their satisfaction right, for the first time. So those are some of the things that look at the systems model. So the patient, this patient-centered care becomes, you know, one of the six aims of the Institute of Medicine, um, which be in the 2000s, which became a big, you know, informed the way we think of, about medicine, that patients' values have to be integrated in the care of a patient. That has to be, a, a, you know, one aspect of how we do medicine. Um, so, and then the patient uh, uh, centered care and communication is not only communication between the healthcare professional and the patient, but also the professional, the healthcare professional team as well. So it, it's not only whether you are, you know, kind of having a, a dyad, you know, communication between you and the patient, but how are you communicating with your, with all the team? Right, with the team that is providing care, because that is very important as well. Um, consideration of access to care. Access to care not meaning only insurance, right? You know, like insurance is an important part of it, but um, access in terms of um, how, do, how do they get there, right? You know, how do they come? Do they have access to get there? Do they have transportation? Is it remote? You, you know, like we were talking about telehealth. You know, do you need to provide some kind of way to reach them? All of those things which you are doing, I hear quite a lot of, is, is that aspect of, you know, like access of uh, how patients get th their care. And then, you know, uh, uh, outcomes, patient satisfaction, quality of care, safety, are all of the things that come with this new model of care that we think of as um, patient-centered uh, care. Now, cultural competency is something that comes into the, uh, the vocabulary, I mean, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago now. And, and that was, you know, that evolved because uh, healthcare professionals felt at one point that they cannot communicate well with the, with the patients, right? You know, and, and the reason was, um, first was language. You know, they couldn't, you know, uh, really un understand and, and communicate because of language differences, but also because of cultural differences, because the model they are thinking of in terms of, you know, the, the biomedical model does not uh, relate to uh, the patient's beliefs and thoughts about what healthcare is, what illness is, what health is. You know, those were the things that they couldn't <coughs> communicate with. So they, then they came with the thought, oh, we have to kind of create a system where we, uh, we can learn uh, culture, right? And so it became a system where um, well, most of it was, uh, oh, let's get a vocabulary uh, of uh, things that we need to know. So if I'm uh, caring for, uh, for, I don't know, um, a uh, Hispanic person from Mexico, I need to know, you know, like, oh, what do they eat and what do they feel about health and what do they, so I have kind of a, a menu item where I can kind of flip and see, right, you know, uh, or if it's somebody from Nepal, I'll, you know, look, if, you know, so then what happened with that is that in many ways, uh, it was very, very valuable because that is what, what actually triggered the whole, you know, uh, language interpretation system. You know, so now you, you go anywhere, you get it, right? You know, that's, that wasn't the case before. You know, you didn't have it. So you have to have, the, you know, maybe a child or a family member to come and, and translate for you. But now you have, you know, the, the, the translation interpretation system that is widespread. And that was the result of that. The failing 
was that there was an assumption that I can go through a menu and understand what, you know, like everybody needs, right? You know, first of all, I could not get to that, you know, right? You know, I wouldn't know what every culture is, you know, has things about health and illness and, and have a menu item that I can look at. And, and secondly, it's really impossible to do. So, so that became kind of, um, it, it created another layer of stereotyping as well. Because now, you know, like, oh, if, if somebody comes from Nepal, I have already, you know, like, a menu item in my mind, right? You know, like, that I'm working with. And that might not be the case. So I'm actually stereotyping people unnecessarily, which kind of creates a problem in that patient communication. Instead of, you know, like, trying to find out uh, what it is they're looking for, what are the things that are, uh, that are important. So there's another term that comes in, which is, you know, cultural humility. So it's not about knowing, but about humble, humility. So it's, it's really thinking about that I cannot know, right? You know, like when somebody comes in, I cannot know what they are or who they are, but I know who I am, right? So if I know where I come from and what my culture is, and I can be humble enough to actually interact with them and find out, Right? You know, that is the interaction that which kind of guides then the, the care that is provided. So the role is, you know, becomes um, a, a shift where uh, we try to elicit information in the context of their understanding of health and illness. Right? You know, so it's not like, oh, we define what it is, but rather we try to actually elicit in their form of understanding of, you know, what their illness is that they are coming with. And then we tr translate in the way they can understand, right? So you become like this, this uh, uh, person now who interacts with another person who comes from somewhere without really knowing who they are because you cannot know, right? You know, you can't be competent completely because it's impossible to, to be competent. But, but you are always open, right, you know, to understand and to relate. So it is a, ne a negotiation of, you know, an understanding of what they come with, what they feel their, uh, their, their challenge or concern is, and then, you know, to, uh, to also be able to relate and to, uh, to, uh, to relay the information um, from your perspective uh, the way they can understand it. So cultural humility is, uh, takes in all types of cultural differences. So then, you know, we kind of moved away from because the cultural competency was actually a question of uh, to understand immigrant populations. In that was the, the first <coughs> topic of the, the day. And so now cultural humility uh, becomes an approach where you can really understand in, in differences in general. And, and beyond the exploration of culture, um, unconscious bias also becomes an issue, right? You know, so because we are now more aware, you know, we're not really looking at, okay, what do I need to know about this other person? It becomes, what do I need to know about me, right? You know, like, and what are the biases that I have uh, that kind of can, can be a barrier to care uh, or that could help me care better, right? You know, that's, those are the things that we can understand. And, and beyond interpersonal communication, it becomes a community engagement. So it's not only, we're not looking anymore at one person, right? You know, at, at a time, a patient comes in and I take care of that patient and the patient goes and another patient comes in, but rather we're looking at, you know, like, oh, where did this patient come from, right? Which neighborhood, which environment? What are, you know, like the, the context of health and care and everything that, that relates to that person's community, right? And how can we actually um, care and advance health in the broader context of community and not only one person, one take at a time, right? And that kind of changes the whole environment of what we think about medicine today in general, right? Because it's not, you know, it becomes uh, not care by, you know, at each procedure at a time, but rather, you know, like you, you, t you get a holistic view of, you know, uh, how do, you know, what are the outcomes of the, the, the care that person receives? And then you can look at it, what are the outcomes of the care 
the, in, translate it to the community where that person comes from. So we are looking at zip codes now, right? You know, we, ma we are mapping and seeing, you know, oh, you have, you know, like in this zip code, you have this kind of health issues, right? And then you see why is that. And then the, the reasons can be very different, as you can see here, because they are social determinants of health, right? You know, because it's not um, only 20% of actually healthcare is related to the clinical thing that we can do, right? If the, where, you know, like, oh, okay, oh, somebody comes in, or there's a genetic problem that we can deal with, or whatever it is, clinically. 80% has to do with everything else, you know, whether someone has a job, whether someone has an education, whether someone has um, um, proper care. Uh, so all of those things become like 80% of the health and illness that we have is related to where we live and how we live, right? It's not related really to the clinical care that we get in that 20%. So this is, you know, where we live, how we live, the circumstances we have been in, where we are born, how we were born, and all of those things determine um, our health outcomes. And so therefore, it is very important to, for us to know that. So these are all, you know, overlapping domains, right? You know, where, where knowledge, where we have, you know, an understanding, the meaning of culture, and it, it's important. Attitudes, you know, having respect for variations in cultural norms, right? You know, that, is, that deals with it. And then skills. The skills are, you know, like how do we get information from patients and communities? And how do we relate our, you know, information? How do we negotiate in that care environment with them, right? So those are the things that are important. So there comes now implicit bias is a new thing that, that has been around now the last 15 years. And so the understanding is that, um, of course, there are, you know, like real biases right out there, discrimination and things like that, where, you know, we actually do not provide care and we discriminate and so on and so forth. But, but the implicit bias is something that says that all of us are biased, you know, like to begin with, right? You know, all of us are biased and those biases could have negative impact on the way we behave, and the way we interact with others, and then it could, ha it could have an impact on outcomes as well. It could influence our feelings, you know, like our immediate feelings uh, and our attitudes. And then in the end, you know, like the outcomes. And it can be like, you know, if you have you know, a front line where you're receiving uh, patients. Uh, however, you know, our little biases can make a very big difference in the way we actually interact. And that happens all the time. And then we can all think about, you know, the bias that we have and how it has kind of uh, made some impact in our lives. So it is basically on a conscious level, most of us would think that we are not racists, we are not sexist, we are not bad people, right? You don't think that's, that's how we feel. But there are, you know, like at, at, at an unconscious level, we may be doing discriminatory things that we are not even aware of, right? You know, like, so that's what happens. By the way, bias is not only negative. We, al well, we also bias, you know, positively. And that positive bias can also be not a great thing, right? Because we can actually do things um, to, with, with our bias positively that might not be, might not have a good outcome actually for individuals and ourselves. And so we need to be um, aware of that. So it's, it's possible to act in prejudicial ways even when, you don't, when we don't think about it. So this science evolved over the past 15 years and, and it's, a, it's a, a, a combination of um, social psychology or how we interact and uh, cognitive psychology or how we think and neuroscience as well. So it's basically, uh, uh, it tells us about how our brain is, um, is, is wired truly. Can we, can I? Now this is a little clip. It's a movie house.
No. <laughs> it's just a beer commercial. <laughs> so, um, so basically, <laughs> so we do, we do act, that's, that's not very unfamiliar, right? You know, because we do act in that, I mean, it's exaggerated a bit, it's a beer commercial after all. But, but you can see how you act in that way. You enter in, a, in an environment and you start seeing some, some things that kind of trigger your bias. And you may have made up your mind. And that might not be the case. And we do that all the time. But we can't tell because it is, it is unconscious. And what happens is actually our brains immediately edit information without us knowing it. And so, you know, like when you look at this now, uh, A and B are different colors, right, in there. It, right? They look different. But actually they're not. Because, you know, like this is thing is, we, we, are, we are, you know, editing information because we, do, we, do, we see patterns and we edit them. You know, it's the brain that does it. And we do it all the time. Now, can you read this? Can you read it? You can't read it, right? It's hard to read. How about this? You can read it, right? It's the same kind of jumbled stuff that we saw earlier, right? But however, it has, you know, it gives us enough, you, you don't have to kind of really work hard to read it, right? You're reading it immediately. Because your brain is actually filling the, the, the remaining um, letters right away. You don't have to think about it. So it doesn't take you time to think about that. Um, so, and this is, this is, you know, the old, so that's what we think about bias was when we, you know, in the old days we thought, oh, you know, bad people are biased and uh, if, our, if they are biased, what we need to do is, you know, get them through some kind of training or get rid of them and everything will be fine, right? But now it's a different story, right? Because in most cases we might be discriminating without even realizing that we're doing that, right? And we might be actually discriminating against our beliefs, right? You know, like thinking that, you know, oh, what we're doing is totally, you know, we are, we know that we're not doing it. That's not us, but we might be doing it even then because we don't know. It's because it's, it's unconscious. And the reason is that because our brain is actually formed in that way. You know, it's formed in that way to process information quickly because we have to avoid threat and know what is, you know, uh, what is not threatening immediately so that we can function in this world. Because we can't go out now, you know, like if I go out on the street uh, and I see, a, you know, a, a clunk of metal coming towards me, uh, I'm not going to stand and think, okay, what can that be now, right? I'll jump out of the way not to get crushed, right? I wouldn't think, oh, this must be a friendly thing coming towards me. Maybe a hug. No. <laughs> so, so those are, but that is how the brain functions because we are bombarded with a lot of information that we need to process quickly. And that's how our brain functions. It processes quickly, quickly so that we can avoid threat and know what is good for us, right? But that's what we do when we see people as well. So immediately when we see somebody, um, when you saw me this morning, you have made up some kind of thing because some pattern had come up and thought, oh, look at this guy, he's wearing a tie, he's wearing this, he must be this, he must be that, right? Um, oh, and then as soon as I open my mouth and you hear how I talk and there's, you know, like kind of, oh, some assumptions, some patterns that form that kind of puts me in some category because it's categorization that, you know, they put patterns and then you say, okay, there's a decision that's made in seconds. That this, and the worst part is, you know, usually those decisions actually stick. That's what the research says. So if you like immediately thought I was a nice guy, that had stuck. You know, that was, you know, or if you thought, oh, you just didn't like me. I remind you of somebody. Then, you know, that also sticks very immediately. And, and, and then, you know, it's, you're, we remain with that. So even if you're not reacting in a way that's immediately visible, that could affect the way you treat me, you know? The way you like you're doing things and the way you treat somebody becomes immediately. Um, have you had big experiences where you saw somebody and you didn't really, there was something about them that you didn't like 
And then, you know, over time you realize, oh, you know, what was I thinking, right? Be because, you know, like those patterns kind of stick immediately and they, def they define your relationship. And then it's also culturally transmitted. You know, like we have, you know, we get all this information, you know, through the media, you know, like and so on and so forth. And those patterns are formed and those patterns then become, you know, like automatic patterns that kind of float up as soon as we make information. So this is like a, a scene from the Katrina flood in, uh, in New Orleans, if you remember when that was. And then you have the same picture, you know, the person on the left side or on your left, yes, um, was um, um, plodding through the water after finding food in the supermarket, right? The two people on the right, same thing, plodding through water after finding food in the supermarket. Now, the description is that the person on the left was plodding through water after looting. The two on the right have found food, and because they needed it, obviously. They all needed it, the food. We are right, you know, like that was the flooding in, in New Orleans. However, the, the, the description is different. And the description is different because of, you know, like possibly the, 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 the journalist who wrote that had that pattern in the, in, the, in the head to say that, oh, oh, this is a young black man, you know, he must have been looting. And these two people are, you know, they look you know, like nice people. They must have, you know, like kind of been stranded and gotten some food from the supermarket. And those are, you know, that those patterns kind of remain and they inform our, our interpretation of the world as well, all the time. And so that's how actually, oh, without even thinking, we come to kind of conclusions without knowing. And then, you know, our behaviors and our feelings and our attitudes are then affected and determined by that. And so the implicit association test was, was developed by Greenwald and Banaji. And so the reason why, you know, this implicit association test was developed was obviously if I asked you uh, to, to give me a, a, if I gave you a survey and if I asked you questions as to, oh, are you biased about this? Are you biased about that? You would say, no, I'm not, you know, and that would be truthful, right? You know, like you wouldn't be lying. However, implicit bias works in an unconscious ways. And the way it developed was actually Greenwald, who is a psychologist, and they're both, you know, like one is at, uh, at Harvard, the other one was um, at Stanford. And um, so the way he developed it was he was in the lab thinking about this implicit associations we make in our brains, you know, the patterns <coughs> we make. So he created a list of flowers and a list of insects, right? You know, a list of flowers, a list of insects, and then came up with a list of words that are good or bad, right? You know, that we think of as, you know, good words and bad words. So, and then he went to do like this test where he was making this implicit associations quickly, right? You know, like, so, oh, a flower appears, a bad word appears, you know, and then you have to associate which is which, right? You know, so he had, you know, when he was doing that, he had trouble associating the bad words uh, with flowers and the good words with insects because he had some feelings about insects some feelings about flowers, you know, flowers are nice, insects are bad. So therefore, he had trouble quickly associating the good words with, uh, with insects and the bad words with flowers. And then what he did was he, he actually changed the flowers and insects with a white face and a black face. And then he, was, he ran the test on himself and he found out that he had trouble associating bad words with the white face and good words with a black face, you know, so he would trip, you know, when he was doing that quickly. And you have to do it, the whole idea is because it's an implicit association set. You do it quickly and you try to see, you know, like where you are, you know, kind of making mistakes, right? That's how it works. So uh, I will run this for you to see how it works. Could a dizzying series of images and word associations reveal racial preferences you never knew you had? Could these blurry images reveal much more about you than you ever wanted anyone else to know? I should warn you now, this isn't the same order. <laughs> these two psychologists designed the test and say that's exactly what the experiment does. And they say you'll understand exactly how once you watch it closely. 
Okay, I'm ready. Okay, here it is. Let's see how Rhonda fares. In the first half of the test, she's told to associate negative words and black faces with the left box, positive words and white faces with the right. Left, right, right. For instance, left. the word war appears. She correctly links it to the left box, which says bad and has a black face. Then there's a black face. Once again, the left box. Left, right, right, left, right. She just as easily links the word peace to the right box, marked good with a white face. Right. And when a white face flashes onto the screen, Rhonda also matches that with the right box. But let's see how she does when the information is reversed, when the left box, marked bad, has a white face, and the right box, labeled good, has a black face. Left, left. Suddenly the test becomes much more difficult for Rhonda. About a third of the way through, she makes a mistake, linking the white face to the right box, even though that shows a black face. <laughs> I lost it. Okay. <laughs> Has Rhonda stumbled because she unconsciously associates white with good? What would you imagine your score might indicate? Well, I could tell when I was taking it, I had so much of an easier time doing the white with good, much to my dismay, that I'm sure I'm showing a, a preference. I don't know how strong, and I'm kind of scared to find out, actually. <laughs> in, in fact, the test is showing a strong preference for whites. It's, it's upsetting, but it's, I'm, as I said before, I'm not surprised. And I think it's because we live in an extremely racist society where messages are given to us in many different ways. We may not be as impartial as we think we are. Absolutely. In fact, chances are we're not. Chances are we're not. Something like 79 or 80 percent of white Americans who take the test show a preference for white over black. Just 17 percent of whites show a preference for African Americans. And all of these results occurred even though we put this test to its toughest challenge, testing men and women with a dedicated commitment to racial equality. People like Jeff, who once marched with Martin Luther King Jr. All of those things um, tell me who I am as a person. And Rhonda, an attorney. I spent um, the last 10 to 15 years being a civil rights lawyer and, and trying to do some good in the world, but that doesn't make me immune from my own internal prejudices, and I think I just need to work on that. So, so this is how it works. And so uh, there is the implicit bias test. You can take it. You know, it's actually available. And um, there, there are questions, obviously, about, you know, there have been all, a lot of questions about the validity of the test. Is it, you know, all which comes first? Uh, or um, is it like, a, you know, some kind of uh, being quick on, on, the, on, on the keyboard that might uh, influence it? However, there have been a lot of uh, uh, randomized tests that's done. Millions of people have done it because it's an online test, and so it has, it has been randomized a lot of ways. And, and when you see the tests, actually, anybody can do it. You have a lot of different categories. You know, it has, you know, race, but weight and LGBT status and gender and disability and social class. And even they had it for uh, during the presidential elections. They had, uh, they had an implicit association test with the president. And it was very interesting to see that people who were actually, you know, voting knowingly, you know, like they know who they are voting for, they still had some kind of actually implicit bias that was against that, <laughs> that person. Although they were, you know, like clearly voting for that person because they like what, what that person stands for, right? But the implicit bias, is, that's how it works. So you can take the test, that is the, it takes 10 minutes, and it's very interesting to see actually on, on different categories where, where, you, where you fall. But again, it's not really, you know, like it doesn't mean that you, you behave in that way or you act in that way. It just means that you carry that implicit bias. And so, you know, it's good to be aware of it. But you also see it actually uh, working in real life, right? That implicit bias. You know, like you have like only about 15% of US men are over six feet tall, but almost 60% of Fortune 500 CEOs are over six feet tall. Now, you know, like I'm sure there are no search, search committees sitting there and, you know, screening for height. 
but you know, like it's it's really their implicit patterns that are that people carry make them um, are vulnerable to to those decisions that they make, right? And when you switch it, when you change things, then you can see the changes as well. Only five percent of uh, symphony orchestras in the U.S. Of, were women a few years ago, and when they implemented a screen during the audition process, that went up to thirty percent. And the only, you know, but so what happened is that you had judges that were, you know, like sitting and um, and um, uh, looking at auditioning uh, of uh, for the for the symphony orchestras, and obviously their implicit biases were were uh, uh, making barriers for women to be considered for that. Although they were listening, so when they listened to the music without seeing who it was then you know that made the change and there are you know a lot of different tests and research that has been done in this area uh, that that changed the thing and then the other side of it is also it's not as if you know you're implicitly biased only you know uh, against someone who is not like you you know you can be <laughs> actually biased against yourself as this this uh, research shows so this was a research that was done um, 118 male, 120 female psychologists uh, were tasked with hiring someone in their department, right? And they were given um, a, a, a resume to look at in order to evaluate for hire. And most of them, both the 118 male and the 120 female, hired the male candidate, although the resume was the same. It, the change was only the name, you know, of a male and a female candidate. But they all, you know, most of them hired the female candidate. The female as well, right? The female psychologist. So that pattern is really something that is, that, you know, is developed over time. And it informs us and it makes some, uh, some decisions. Same thing when we look at, you know, this is another study that was done on um, recommendation letters of medical faculty, right? You know, who are already in, the, in, uh, in medical schools and they're teaching. And when they looked at the resumes, uh, the CVs, and uh, the recommendations that were written for women, they were quite biased in many ways. You know, they it talked about they were shorter, they gave minimal assurances, they talked about feelings rather than professionalism. They were saying, you know, like a learner rather than, you know, like a professional. You know, so those are some of the things that actually make a big difference in hires, for example, you know, in, in the way we hire. You have also, there have been some research done in the clinical environment that shows there is, there is some bias, implicit bias works in that area as well. You know, this is, you know, a study that was done uh, with uh, 287 residents uh, regarding an intervention uh, a recommendation for for two patients, one white, one one black, and after the the uh, participants took the implicit association test, and it showed that you know a lot there were differences in the way people actually were recommending um, this important life-saving interventions uh, to the two uh, uh, patients. And there's also been a, a lot of research done uh, with, with physicians um, in regards to their biases towards um, obese patients. And that was like a huge, a huge bias actually there that, 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 was, that was shown. And so there have been, you know, like really a number of research that was done. Um, and um, the, obviously, the most obvious uh, uh, research that, that was done, that, that's the communications aspect in the clinical environment, is one where implicit bias really works. And, um, and you see that uh, in, in this test that there were poorer communication, shorter visits, you know, like all of those that affect actually care are a result of you know, some implicit biases that, uh, that healthcare professionals could have. Um, what are you know like have you do you recognize have you seen any now that we've talked about implicit bias do you, do you see anything like that in the clinical environment that you can recognize that you can think of or in your life in general no <laughs> It 
happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> we have, you know, the, Im we do Im the implicit bias uh, uh, training. We integrate it into our, into our curriculum. So we do it with cases while we're doing with students. And that's how it starts. And, and um, nobody really, you know, like you kind of see it and you, you understand it, but um, um, nobody wants to think of an example immediately until, you know, you kind of get into um, maybe a clinical discussion. And then that comes into some <laughs> form. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm willing to share this one in that of late, I've been having some health issues. And what I have noticed is actually a reverse bias that I've kind of developed in taking care of my mother where my mother is very the doctor said it so I have to do it and I'm like no 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 yeah. you know you need to internalize what they're saying you need to match it with your life yeah. and your experience and decide what outcomes you want yeah and so my experience lately has been with some stuff is it's like you know I, I'm very um, I'm sort of implicitly judging the doctors as not listening to me yeah. and not taking what I'm saying mm -hmm. into account and it's been very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is, you know, like an obvious, there must be a reason for that. Right. So, I mean, those are some of the things that we need to think about uh, because we need to think generally, you know, what are, what are some of the things that are triggering? There's always something that, that is triggering some bias, right? It can be you know, a past experience, um, association of someone with someone else, you know, all of, you know, there are a lot of different things that, oh, someone can associate with someone, some relative that you have that you didn't like. And then that kind of triggers that bias. And, and immediately it blocks any kind of progress that you can make in, in, in the, sometimes bias actually works in a different way. Someone can associate you, can be very similar to you. And, and that also has, has a, a big bias. We had, um, a speaker who does quite a lot of work uh, on reflective practice from uh, uh, she used to be a colleague in New York and um, so we had her come and uh, and give a talk here about her book and uh, and one of the the examples she gives is she's a Jewish woman from Brooklyn you know so and she works at Bellevue Hospital at New York uh, University Medical Center and um, and so she says one of the biggest mis mistakes she made in, in, in her clinical life was there was this woman who came to see her and it was a Jewish woman from Brooklyn who just looked exactly like her, right? You know, who sounded exactly like her. And she made a big mistake and missed a diagnosis who had, you know, like she had a heart problem and she couldn't get it because she was, you know, looking at her and thinking, oh, this is a woman like me, hyper, you know, and stressed and, and that's just, it's not a heart problem. And she missed the diagnosis. And that's like a bias that is actually, that is not someone who is different from you, but who is, who is like you, right? You know, so those are some of the things that happen. So we have to kind of stop and think, you know, what, is, you know, what are the biases we have? Um, and then generally, um, the way we, we deal with bias is to decategorize. Because bias always works, you know, the patterns work with, with categories, right? So I see a person and I don't see that person alone. I see a whole group, right, behind them because I'm categorizing them as old or young or, you know, whatever cat big categories that I can, I can think of. Or, you know, the Hispanic or uh, uh, African-American, something. And, and it's very important to decategorize people, right? And that's the way it works, because we need to kind of think about, oh, who am I talking to? Let's kind of think about um, um, person-centered care. And then putting yourself in their shoes, right? That's usually the case. You know, what, you know how are they feeling? You know, well, think of them as someone that you know, that you love. If this was my daughter, my sister, you know, what would that be like, right? Um, and it usually happens because we're always in a hurry, right? And that's where, you know, those patterns take on. Like when I'm crossing the street and I have to jump because I'm thinking about something else. They happen when, I'm, when you're rushing, you're in a clinical area and you don't have any time and you're just, you know, like kind of quickly going through things. And you're, you're obviously working on automatic pilot 
and that's that's when those those biases actually can can trigger your behavior and um, so those are, these are some of the things that you should remember that it is natural right you know so it's no you're not bad or <laughs> you're not good or anything it's not about that it's just a natural process that we have we see our the world through our lenses we don't have any other lens to look at it with right you know and those lenses are you know formed with those patterns that we share so we have to be aware of that um, and we make unconscious decisions when we are busy, right? You know, those are, you know, then we are on automatic pilot. So, and it kind of has a problem. It is a problem. So we have to be really, whether it's in our, in our own lives, as you mentioned, you know, it's not only in your work, but in your own lives as, as you go through it. Um, uh, but also in your work, it, it could have outcomes um, that could have an impact on us and others. One of the big things that we're looking at on the, now um, is how that affects actually uh, the health of healthcare professionals themselves. Because there's a lot of uh, uh, the burnout that we see, a lot of uh, burnout, a lot of health issues uh, uh, with healthcare professionals that are associated with, with that as well. Because of, you know, it triggers negative issues that come out of care and the outcomes that we see and then you know like that kind of becomes a cycle where it affects everybody so it is very important to see how uh, to see those things so recognize that we have bias develop a capacity to flash a light on yourself um, practice to be you know vulnerable and uncertain that because that's usually what happens we want to be certain always you know we want to know everything we want to have a menu about things it's fine to be vulnerable and uncertain. And that's how we, we, we could function, actually. And then engage with people who are different, because that kind of stretches your, your ability to kind of understand and, um, and mitigate bias. Because we tend to be always you know, all where we are comfortable, right? And, and so we don't stretch ourselves to see, oh, you know, this is not really that, that different at all, right? You know, so, those are some of the things that we, uh, we need to look at. So thank you so much. Do you have any questions and thoughts? I think this is where we are. Thank you, and this is my email if you need to reach me. <laughs>